Let's look at verse 14. Well, let's start at verse 14 because I think we're going to go. Um, <clears throat> all the way through 17. Yeah. This is uh, Genesis chapter 15. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. Okay, so we know that this is talking about 400 years from now, they're going to go into bondage in Egypt. And um, thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. So the fourth generation, uh, or in the fourth generation of Israel, <coughs> the people of God, they're going to return it's interesting, this is God talking, and he says they're going to return here. Seems that interesting. To, well, I mean, where is here? Well, he is talking about coming to the promised land, the land of promise. Um, and then verse uh, 16, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And then uh, verse 17, <clears throat> and it came to pass that when the sun went down, and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So there was this dark, it was dark. The sun went down, and it was dark. Now, we've, we've addressed this um, on a couple of levels. Uh, in relationship to Abram, in relationship to his seed, in relationship to why the, um, the um, I always want to say captivity, <laughs> their bondage in Egypt <clears throat> lasted so long, not necessarily why they went down there, but why it lasted so long in relationship to the Amorites. Remember, we, did, we talked about that. And of course, that was me going off on, you know, I think there are still within them, within us, Amorite uh, attitudes and things that the Lord wants to deal with, and then he can bring us fully into the land. But he's dealing with us to bring us to a place of <clears throat> need and openness and brokenness so that he's able to do what he wants to do so that um, like the new covenant says I will take away their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh meaning not they'll be fleshly people but pliable pliable and uh, that's a big deal it's a big deal to the Lord there's so much religion there's so many people that don't really even relate to him on a heart-to-heart -heart basis and so so this is something that he's uh, that he wants to bring about. Um, and then I talked about uh, maybe maybe this <clears throat> thick dark dread uh, that Abraham experienced had to do with um, his seed, because it hadn't come yet, not even Isaac, but his seed and what they're going to be going through, because it's pretty dark thing <clears throat> and um, let's see let me just see if there's something here when the fire falls from God it signifies his acceptance on the sacrifice so what we're having is this uh, smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces so <clears throat> this is God saying to him this is this is reality and the deal is you know I don't know how many of you really have consider this, but when God says something to us, or there's a word from the Lord, and somebody speaks a prophecy over you, or a word of wisdom, or whatever, it may not mean what we assume that it says. We should take it back to the source, you know, because, you know, I've had words over me, and, you know, it's like, I mean, pretty early on, I learned to go, 
if you don't tell me what this really means, I'm not going to know, so I'm not going to assume this means like Joseph's dreams, you know. Immediately, I'm going to become, you know, that's so us. That is so us. Scott? Verse in Exodus 21 that talks about um, the people stood afar off from Moses. He would be in the thick darkness where God was. Yeah. And you know, just a, a holy, holy thing. That, you know, just almost like that place of, that the Lord wants to draw us. That, you know, there is no light for our senses to. Uh, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> God's speaking these terrible things, and they're speaking it in the midst of uh, what I'll declare further on down here is double darkness, <clears throat> the sun going down, and then this darkness that comes. Um, um, but then we see that the fire, the acceptance of God, the fire falls on the sacrifice. So it's not, it's not, <clears throat> we get all wrapped up in the, in the fear of the death, but this is the, the acceptance of the offering, which means there's going to be resurrection. They will come forth out of this situation, you know. Now, I don't believe our hope should just be in that. Our hope is in the Lord. Can we just do that? Not just that he's a deliverer or that he's going to fix everything. <clears throat> My hope is in you by your son. You put your son in me, you know. And... Um, from that, there's a relationship instead of just some sort of a set of doctrines. Well, I believe that, you know, if there's a death, there's a resurrection. Uh, rather, in your heart, and that this is the way that you are, and it is. It's the faith of Abraham. Abraham found it. We haven't even fully developed that yet. But he found it, and when I say haven't fully developed it, because you have to get to 22, not for the answer, but the progression to see it all then. Then you go, oh, 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 oh. And a lot of it looked like failure along the way. <clears throat> when it wasn't failure, it was God working in him something. And sometimes we need to fail before he can really, he can, before he can really get our attention. You know, a failure, not just, oh, I'm angry with myself, but a failure that hurts, like a failure that hurts someone else that we love, or this or that. And... And it should strike deep within us. But those, those are things we'll get into later. So, so where did the acceptance come from then? The acceptance came from God. Where did it fall? It fell on the altar. I can't say that enough. The scriptures can't say it enough. It fell on the altar and on the sacrifice that was on the altar. And one of the things I remember when I say that is that those, those beasts, those animals, they, they were cut open and their insides were laid bare to the Lord. And the Lord fell and accepted it. In other words, God did not, how can I say this? God did not really accept in the future, you know, because he's, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He didn't really look at Israel going through all that stuff and say, well, I accept that just because they went through trials. There is no glory in going through trials or, or deaths unless it pertains to his death. It is his selfless giving. It's his life. Well, you didn't really see, I mean, the only place you saw that when they came out of Egypt was the death of the lamb, not the death of them. Right? And so, so here we see the acceptance at the altar. Here the fire passes through. And here God says, I'm accepting that. Now, we can talk about that a little more here in relationship to some of the words that came up. But let me, <clears throat> let me go ahead and go with this. Um, um, so when did the acceptance start? With the altar. When a smoking fire pot showed up to burn up the sacrifice, that's when the acceptance started. Okay. So that's Christ. That's Jesus. That's the Lamb. That's Him. That's representative of Him. Every sacrifice is representative of Him. Either Him, Him, or Him and us. 
but it's him. It's not our it's not our greatness of being so selfless. We're not. None of us are. We are extremely selfish. Did y'all know that? Okay, just just check it cuz <laughs> cuz they don't know it yet. So I'm glad y'all got it. <clears throat> it really is true. It is true. That's the one of the main reasons why I wanted Jesus cuz I could I saw things in me that I didn't like and I said I hate this stuff I don't want to be this way and when I saw Jesus when I saw the lamb not just Jesus see most people see Jesus the Savior which is fine that's fine good come in through the door <laughs> you know but I saw instantly another life that was different than me and I said now that's what I want if that takes me to quote unquote heaven or whatever, that's, that's not my business. You know what I mean? I mean, that's not, I shouldn't be all wrapped up in that. My business, my heart is wrapped up in him and that's what I want. I want, and he'd go, well, well, tell me what you want. I want you. Well, just, you know, point at it. I'm pointing at you. Uh, what can I do for you? Nothing, I want you in here. <clears throat> So imagine if you do that to him, because nobody hardly does, if, if you will. You know, I don't know everybody, and, uh, you know, and I'm not assuming that we're some sort of super spiritual race or something here. I know better. <laughs> you know, I know that that's not the case. What I'm saying is that that draws his heart out, because that's the new covenant. That's the, that's the reason for um, there being a firstborn, so that that could happen. And remember, all this has to do with the firstborn. We've never left that subject. Um, why did the, uh, the acceptance fire pass through them? <clears throat> because it was open, the open insides were what he accepted, because <clears throat> everything else, excuse me, everything else protects itself. Everything else is seeking for a way around these things. Everything else wants to hide certain portions. And if you just, you know, see, it's not going to be you, but you have to say, I'm open. I, I've done this bunches of times. Lord, I know I'm not perfect. My heart is not perfect but I'm open right now to you as much as I know how at this moment. Please move me forward into that because if I knew how to do it, I would do it, but I got a feeling you want to do it. And I don't know, he seems to answer those kind of prayers, you know, because they're hard prayers, you know, and they're real and they're open and they're saying, hey, you know, just look. David did that, didn't he? Anybody remember that? <clears throat> David said, I want truth in the inward parts, not just truth in the, in the doctrines. You can have all your doctrines straight and not have truth in the inward parts, and that's going to come by Christ himself, and that's going to come right here at the time of the altar. Okay? That's why it's happening. That's the very reason why it's happening. And then reading verse 17 again, um, and it came to pass that when the sun went down, this is important, <clears throat> and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. So before I read the next part, let's just talk about that double darkness. It, it was on a night of double darkness, uh, and it was in the midst of a lot of death. What does that mean? All those animals, all of those animals representing Christ, this is the stage set by God. This is the, this is the heart of, of the, the way that he flows so that we understand that. So, so you got all this darkness and all this stuff. Um, and then I wrote, um, 
It was on a night of double darkness and much death that the Lord made the covenant. Let me read it again, verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Do you see that? In the same thing that's going on here, instead of God being, you know, rejecting and things like that, Christ in his death has bought and paid for all that and has brought us into it because that will be the thing. Well, you know what? We'll read some things on the new covenant. But that's what, that's what he did. And so he's making that covenant at the altar. He's making it with his sacrifice, representative of his firstborn son, counting for that. Because the firstborn, anybody remember coming out of Egypt? The firstborn were meant for death, to, to live this life, if you will, to live this self-giving way. They were meant for that. They were called to it. You know, it says in, uh, in Romans, you know, all things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. They're called unto this purpose that Christ may be formed in us so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're called into this whole thing. We're called into it. We're called to be those who will say, it's not going to be about just being a good Christian and going to church and being happy and, oh, God, bless me, and, oh, I'm going through something, so I'll go down to an altar, which is, ah, Anyway, they go down to, a, you know, those things, and they pray, but it's not an altar. There's no death. There's no thought of death. There's only help me, give me. Okay, and again, I'm not trying to be critical. I'm talking about the calling. <laughs> you know, I'm talking about the calling that love God. By this perceive you the love that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our, down our lives for the brethren. We're called to it. We're all called to it. And the purpose is so that he can be the firstborn in us. And we'll see that. We'll see that shortly. <clears throat> okay. Um, so all, all that this covenant entails, because in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, all of it that it entails is based upon the altar. It's based upon the cross. Um, and I wrote, it is there that he wanted to communicate the secret things of his heart. Okay. All right. Well, we don't see that in these scriptures. You don't, I mean, you do. I think it's plain, but we don't see that naturally unless we already know somewhat of his heart. We're not going to see that he's literally communicating the secret things of his heart in this thing. We're going to just say, Ooh, thank God he had a sacrifice so that those things died so I wouldn't have to die and not, not really have a, any clue of his heart. Just walk away going, yay, good job. You know, you saved the best, me. <laughs> so, <clears throat> all right, so he made a covenant. Let me read um, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15. You can turn with me, but keep your place there possibly in uh, Genesis. Galatians 3, verse 15. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth it or addeth to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Period. Get it? Nobody's going to disannul this. This one, he made this with his son. And with those who would bring him forth. Amen? You see that? Um, he saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. This is the covenant he's talking about. This is the Abrahamic covenant. Um... Verse 17, and this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, the law, now he's starting to talk about the law, which was 430 years after, after what? After Abraham, after the covenant that God made with Abraham that he kept confirming all through Abraham's walk, right up until 20, 
Genesis 22, <clears throat> which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of non-effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. All right. So what did, he, what did God give to Abraham by promise? Somebody. The seed, the seed, the seed. Hallelujah. And the seed is the promise. And the seed is the thing that is going to fulfill it all. The seed is the thing that, that we need. The seed is the reality. And so he's saying, you know, and I, I didn't want to get off too much into the law. That we've done, I've taught classes on Galatians in this subject area also before. But the, he's very simply saying, you know, um, 430 years after, because remember, God said to Abraham, your seed will go down into Egypt and they'll be persecuted for 400 years. Well, they, they were down there for 400 years and then they went into the wilderness and it was actually 40 years, but this is giving them a little extra or a little less. 40 years wandering but in the time he gave them the law, it was at Mount Sinai, right? Thank you. And so um, he's saying that that law is not it. What I said was I drew my people together, and they said to me before they let me speak, tell us what you want us to do, and we'll do it. And I said, no, you won't because you don't even you're not even taking into consideration the seed many in Christianity do the same thing they're not even taking into consideration the seed they're just trying to do it for God and I believe they're truly born again okay so I believe they're if whatever if you want to go to that route I believe they're going to heaven but they're they're not living according to the seed they're just trying, and, and they have the want to in them. It's called Jesus. He's in there. But they're not, they're not recognizing that as his life. They're just saying, oh, I, I dedicated my heart to Jesus today or, or my, my life. I went down to the altar and dedicated my life. He doesn't want your life. He wants Jesus' life. You know, stop, stop giving him that. That's blemished sacrifices. Amen? My God. And, and that's part of what I want to get into with this um, thought is I want to bring in another thought in relationship to this deep darkness, and I want it to be now seen from God's perspective. Okay? He's already talking about what Israel's going to do 400 years from now. He's already wounded that the firstborn that died, the lamb that died, and they ate that the firstborns that were redeemed by that when they came out of Egypt never lined up with that spirit. Deep darkness in his heart. So then you see that all through the prophets. Deep darkness in his heart for what he hoped for, for what he wanted. We say, well, he, he, did he hope that Israel would be good? He already saw that from the point that they ate the lamb to the point that they got to Mount Sinai, they had none of that in their mind or heart. Whatever they ate of the lamb was not a reality here on here, particularly here in their heart. It was just, it was an event. It was called the Passover event. That's all it was. And so, so God's already grieved so much that when they get to Mount Sinai and then they start saying, just tell us what you want, he goes, okay. And he describes what Jesus would do and could live in them, but they could never live. The law, you know, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and, you know, all that. Just the first commandment, they couldn't do that fully. Neither can you. So don't get under the law. Do not put yourself under the law, because then you're responsible for the whole law, see. And that's, you know, that's part of the purpose of the new covenant, but the greater purpose of the new covenant had nothing to do with the law, and that's what he's trying to say here in Galatians. He's saying this didn't have anything to do with all the mess-ups you did and all the stuff 
that the main thing this was about is that God made a covenant with Abraham based on the seed and the thing of his heart and the thing of his joy. And now, you, now you're all wrapped up in this law thing and it's just breaking his heart because you're just digging yourself a deeper hole. <clears throat> so uh, let's look in Jeremiah 31. Okay, so the promise to Abraham was what? The seed. Praise God. All right, so we want to discover that a little more. All right, so when we start reading, we're going to read in verse 30, and when we start reading, it's where God, I'm, I'm leaving off a big portion in front of this, but I'm putting in this verse so you can see, God isn't happy with them with their lives under the old covenant. He's not happy with us if we're going to act the same way as if we're Jews and we're responsible to God to do everything right instead of saying, I need your son and I want to give you your son, not just I want to be right. I don't want to use Jesus as a method for keeping the law so that I'm still right with God. I want you to get your son. Okay, and Jeremiah is pressing the point, which he's, he tends to do. <laughs> he's pressing the point, saying, you guys are messed up, and you, you know, you're doing all this stuff and everything. But then he breaks out with the new covenant, which is really the Abrahamic covenant. That's what we read in Galatians. Yes. He's, pointing, he's pointing to the covenant with Abraham. He's not pointing to... The new covenant in the sense of we say, well, the new covenant started right here. He's pointing to the promised seed that would come forth. And that's what you got when you ask Jesus into your heart. Okay. Amen. So verse 31 starts with the law, but then moves into the new covenant. But everyone, sorry, Jeremiah 31, 30. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Does that sound like the law? Yes. Well, it is. Every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. Okay, if you're going to eat this thing, it ain't going to be sweet. <laughs> it's going to be tough because it's the wrong way. And it's not just the wrong way. So if I wrote, so if I wrote Old Covenant on the board and New Covenant over here, which is the best way? Neither. Christ is the way and the truth and the life, but that happens to be the new covenant. Amen? That's what the Bible says. All right, so now we're going to talk that. Verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. He's saying, I am going to establish this thing now. I'm going to establish this thing that I had with Abraham. I'm going to, and, and you know in Galatians, it tells us to have faith, right? Does not all Christians talk about having faith? But why, why is it pointed toward a fancy car or a better job or, you know, oh, Lord, I got faith for this, and you know what I mean? And that's where we're using it all instead of the faith of Abraham, which is new covenant faith. God's going to bring forth his seed in me, even though I, I seem dead, and so does Sarah. See? I mean, at some juncture, you don't, you don't settle for it. Abraham never settled. Remember, even in the beginning of this chapter, he's going, God's going, I am your shield, and you hold it right there. You have not given me the seed. I'm still a mess. I'm still empty. I'm still... My wife's still empty. We're not bringing forth. We want to bring forth the seed, the one you promised. See, he never settled. Don't settle. In fact, I say get radical. I'm serious. I mean, get radical for the seed and say, you know, I, am, I haven't brought him forth the way I, I think you want him, but you know what? My failures and whatever are not the issue. The issue is my heart wants your son coming out of me so that you get all the glory that you wanted from him. 
You make that your heart cry. You don't live in the, what is it, mully grubs? What is that? Is that? Okay, well, there is mully grubs, though. Okay, so, so, what, so here's the, he said, I'm going to make a new covenant with you because I am not going to, see, they don't even know Abraham's covenant in the sense of the seed. They're, they're, they're all into the law by now, you know. And, and he says, uh, you know, I'm going to make a new covenant with them, not the one I made when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant they break. He's saying, I, I'm not going to make one where I have to take you by the hand. Oh, Lord, lead me to this. Oh, Lord, open my eyes to this. Oh, Lord, take me by the hand in that sense. He doesn't want to take a little infant person and he wants Christ formed in us he wants the firstborn in us so that the, the fruit of the firstborn can come forth what's the fruit of the firstborn well selfless giving sacrifice okay but that's his fruit that's not ours and you read the scriptures you read Peter you, you read all the scriptures and you'll find that when you get to that point, it's a joy. There's a glory that rests upon you. It's not like, oh, my God, I'm not going to have to do this again. No. <laughs> you know. Sorry. Thinking of the people on the list there. No, 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 no. There's, you're entering into glory. You're entering into the heart of the Lord. You're entering into the, to the, to the promised land. You're in, you're entering into a land that flows with milk and honey. Not If you're having trouble with everything, it's probably because you're still in the wilderness. It's, and calling it the land of milk and honey. honey. And going, this don't seem so milky to me. Well, it's because you're dragging your old dead carcass into it and call into the wilderness, dragging it through the wilderness for 40 days, or 40 years, and just... You know, I mean, I don't know how much wilderness is there, but they surely ran across the same path they'd begun before. Surely, you know. It's like, have we been here before? I know that cactus. We've been here. Okay, well, that's what you're doing. You're just taking, you're just walking the same path, and you're not getting anywhere, you know. So, which covenant they break. Okay, so this is, this is what I'm calling now, using those scriptures that we saw in Genesis 15, the darkness. Maybe it's darkness that God is having with us because he sees that we're, we just keep going back to the old covenant, old ways, the old things, and all of that, and we just won't break out of it. We won't accept the seed. We say, well, I did accept the seed. That's how I got saved. Okay, is that really it? I mean, is that really, really all that you want him for? I mean, I, again, I say it all the time. I'm saved. I plan on being saved. I'm not worried about it. I have what they call assurance of faith. <laughs> I'm pretty settled on it. So I'm so settled on it, I want to move on to other areas. <laughs> you know, I don't want to just spend my life going, whoa, you know. I'm saved. And then, you know, 10 years later, hey, I'm saved. And, you know, and then 15, 50 years later, I'm saved. You know, how about, you know, the first week, I'm saved. Lord, lead me on. You know, it talks about that in Hebrews. Anyway, so um, which covenant they break. Okay, so we don't see that. We don't, we don't look at Abraham's vision of darkness and what's going on with with the seed, or what should be the seed, but it's not the seed, and, and he's, he's dealing with Amorite situations, and, and he's waiting for them for a certain time period, and all this kind of stuff, but his heart is wanting the seed, and that time period is the day they kill the seed and eat it. Not, not the blood, and then they're, they're not gonna die. That's important, but it's not more important than the firstborn being put on the inside of you. They totally missed that. And so he's going, I'm going to have to lead you by the hand now. It's not going to be, it's not going to be him. And this thick darkness, if, if you will, 
comes on him for the lack of the seed that we won't give him. Okay, so we'll, let's keep reading. Um, here's a good example. So I'm going to read that part in verse 32 again. I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them. Okay, how many of them understood he was a husband even at that time? They didn't understand it. He's God. He's almighty God. He's the supreme being. Jesus said, when you pray, pray our Father. Everything in his heart is trying to get us to the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We, we're supposed to have this relationship on this. But no, we're, we're too enwrapped in all of, all of our religion. It's just religious garb. I mean, we talk about the Pharisees and their religious garb. We've, we're covered in it, but it's not material. We're covered in it because we can't, you know, like Israel, we, we, we just go, okay, lead us, you know. What's leading us? Well, it's a, it's a cloud, you know, by day and fire by night. Where is he taking us? Oh, it's going to be real special, you know, as we keep going, you know. I mean, you know. What, do you think it'd make any difference if they realize, oh my God, we're like a bride to him, a wife, a wife of the lamb. We're like that to him. We're, this is his heart. He's saying it right here. He said it in the Old Testament. Yes. And he's saying, this is, this is what I'm doing by this spirit. And we're going, oh God, almighty God. And he's going, what, who? And what is that? I mean, it's, it's serious for his heart is what I'm trying to say. It's serious for his heart. Verse 33, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. Woo! See? And that's what he meant when he said, open up the sacrifices and lay them out. This is the covenant that he made with Abraham on the day when it was all dark and everything. Do you understand? This is the, this is the same covenant. And he's saying, I want the inward parts. Show me the inward parts. And I want your inward parts to be Christ. I'll put, I'll put those inward parts in you. They'll be him, the seed. Um... I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. Okay, so we know that's what he said. Part of the new covenant is, I'll write it in your hearts. But then in other places, he's going he's gonna to break that open even more. But right now, he's wanting you to know that he wrote it on tables of stone when they asked. Then he gave it to them. And if we're asking, give it to us on our heart. Don't you think if he would do that, that he wouldn't do it here? You know, but what are the factors? I'm in the earth, I'm messed up, or I'm special, or I'm whatever. It doesn't matter, you know, I, maybe I'm not good enough. You know, you're not good enough. Okay, settle that. You're not good enough, stop trying. Because you're just gonna make him mad now, and then you're, then what's going to happen is that every man that eateth the sour grape, his teeth shall be set on edge. So get ready for the... Here, how about this? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. You want that? Is that what you're looking for? <laughs> and this is why I keep these fingernails. Actually, they're guitar picks, but... All right. Um... Write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Uh, and they shall teach no man, uh, every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. Where's this, where's this at in the New Testament? What book? Hebrews. And he's talking about this new covenant. He's talking about this reality of Christ being there. And he's saying that, that it's not going to be... You know the example. We call this a Bible school, right? Well, that's just a name, because we know, right? Don't we know? We're actually learning the Lord. And you can 
mark off, you can have your little list and mark off your classes and stuff like that, but if you ain't getting the Lord, you're failing God. You're failing God's course. Regardless, you can make, you know, you can make great grades here. Did you know that? And still miss the Lord. Is it possible? Has it ever happened before? Um, since we're running out of time, then I'm going to read. Let's go to Ezekiel 36. 36, 26. While you're turning. All right. The promise was to Abraham and his seed, right? The promise was the seed to Abraham. I want you to see that it's not just the promises to Abraham and his seed. The promise to Abraham was the seed, which seed is Christ. And this is a description of the covenant that he made on that same day when it was dark. This is how you move out of the darkness. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. All right. So, um, the new heart, the new spirit, my, is my spirit within you. He's, he says it right here, I will put my spirit within you, okay? And I will give you a new heart, and that is a heart after him, a heart to know him, a heart to seek him, a heart that is that wants the Father glorified by him, by the seed. And it is all the same thing that Abraham is looking for, but maybe doesn't fully know it uh, in the early stages while he's still called Ab Abram, um, that the that the whole covenant that God wanted to, to make clear to Abraham was, remember, we've already hit that stage where he said, well, what about this Eliezer you know, of Damascus? Is he the firstborn then? And, and God got angry. I mean, you could hear it in the wording there. He says, no, he is not going to be your seed. The seed that I want is going to come out of you. Not just, you know, something out here. I'll do something out here. Forget it. It's the inward parts that he's after. Okay, so. Um, so now, uh, next chapter, verse 37, Ezekiel 37, 12. Therefore, Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. Don't you remember that part of this whole thing with the darkness was that God said, and after 400 years when the, we've dealt with the Amorites, I will bring you into the land. This is the land of milk and honey. This is, this is the place that you don't, how did he put it? You don't have to build houses. It's got houses. You don't have to plant fruit trees. It's got plenty of that. It's got all that. Well, go look at Israel now. They have to irrigate like crazy. It's rocky, dry, whatever. Was that the promised land? Jesus is that promised land where you don't have to do all of that stuff. It, it comes by life. It, it's meant to flow out of you. Jesus said, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. That's the life of Christ. That's not, that's not just scriptures. You know, that's the life of Christ in the power of the spirit. I will put my spirit in you, but his spirit is not just the Holy Spirit. His spirit is the spirit of the firstborn. 
That's what he says in Romans 8, that you may be conformed to the image of my son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He's among us, in us, in the midst of us, bringing forth the firstborn nature out of us. <clears throat> That's called opening your graves. <laughs> yeah. Listen. Just bless me, Lord. Wouldn't you really, really rather have your grave opened than, yeah. you know, the one you're living in? Amen. <laughs> See, we're so religious with our words that we're, we miss it because he answers our prayers, you know. He's, you know, be specific, you know. <laughs> Say, Lord, I want to come out of my grave. Amen. Not just, Lord, you know, I'm really, I think I'm having a little problem here. And you're just going, should I, do you want me to talk? No, no, I want to just tell you everything and then leave the, you know, you know, come in, pray, tell you my stuff, and then leave. I'm sure you're fine. <clears throat> um, and bring you into the land of Israel, which is one of the things he said he would do. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit in you, and you shall live. Do you hear all of that? This is, this is my God. This is it. This is the seed. This is the promise to Abraham. This is everything that we're studying. This is firstborn, first class. This is, the, this is the heart of God in relationship to his son. And the joy that he feels. Finally, we're coming out of the dark ages. We're coming out of the darkness of the law and the oppression. oppression. Yeah, we were really oppressed. No, you were oppressing me with your attitudes and your thoughts and the farness from me and not understanding. I was a husband, be, trying to be a husband to you and you're just making me a, a God and acting like everything's fine and that you're doing perfect and you're not. Now I've been in deep darkness for a long time and I'm ready to bring you out. So I'm gonna get my lamb and, and we're gonna kill the lamb and all of you will have to do it. And then you'll have to put his blood out there and then you will eat it and we'll walk out, we'll march out of there in glory heading toward the promised land as the firstborn lives in us. Yay. Woo. <laughs> you know? That's his heart. That's, so, so let me just end with this since it's time to end. There's still oppression, as it were. There's still darkness in our hearts, in our lack of, of really finding him on a heart level, of, of being very astute in the scriptures and knowing so many deep things, and yet... Our hearts are far from him. And he wants our heart because he's going to take it away and put his heart in there. But you have to be willing. The sacrifices always had to be willing sacrifices. He never forced anything. They were all willing sacrifices. And you have to remember that. But, you know, so you have to go before the Lord and you have to say, Lord, I think that maybe you see things a lot different than I do, and instead of me trying to pray you into my understanding, could you bring me into your heart? Amen. 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 Nobody's preaching another class next, right? Let's pray. Father, we just love you, and we, we want to know you the way that you are and the way that you want to be known instead of the way that we have formed you. We have just like the... The, the Israelites, we have formed uh, we, foreign gods um, that were not in your image, that were in our image, that were in our understanding of what it was. And we've worshipped that instead of you. And we, wanna, we want you and we want the, Father, we want the seed that you're the father, your father, Abraham. Abraham was a picture of that. You're the father that wants the seed and we want you to have it. And so we ask you to quicken us, to, to bring us out of our graves, to awaken our heart, like in Song of Solomon, to love and to pursue you, not based on deep truths, but on finding deeply the, the hidden things of your heart. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen.